Today we'll speak on the topic of new life and the way of entering into new life. On the first day, we mentioned how all of you are searching for a new life, a life that is truly satisfying because it doesn't bite its owner, a life that is cool. Actually, it's the old life. What, what we here call the new life is in fact very ancient. Something existed long, long ago. And the life of dukkha, of stress and suffering, is, is much newer. It's this life of dukkha that has, has arisen later. And so this is why we have this need, this in, inbred desire for the, the old life life that is cool and free of dukkha, a life that isn't all busy and troubled. This lack of correctness, this lack of peace has, has just happened. It's just arisen. It's just like the ocean, the waves across the ocean are one thing, and then the, the ocean itself is another. The waves, they arise and they pass away. They arise and they pass away. But the ocean is always there. These waves are, are the dukkha, the problems, the, the busyness and craziness in our lives. But they just arise and pass away. And when, they've, when the waves have passed away, there is the, the peace and the coolness. This is something very ancient and original. It's always been there. But because we've never noticed it, it's something we've just begun to know, it seems very new to us. But in fact, it's, it's older than old. This present life of ours has waves arising constantly. There's, there's ego. There's the sense of self, this I and my, constantly coming up and going, passing away, arising and passing away, arising and passing away. All these waves are something that's happening constantly in this present life. This, the, all these waves are dukkha for us. And so this present life which we have is something we find undesirable because what we really need is, is peace and calm, quiet and coolness. And so we're looking for a way to, to reattain that original peace and tranquility. If we can remove these feelings of ego and self and the, the feelings of positive and negative from our lives, then there won't be any more of these waves, there won't be any more, any more dukkha. And think how, how peaceful and calm that life would be. This is what, in fact, we need most of all. This is what our bodies and minds are telling us all the time. Our problem, however, is that we aren't really able to, to forbid the arising of ego, to stop these feelings of positive and negative. This is because we don't have the knowledge and understanding we need to, to stop these things. So then our way of practice 
needs to be able to restrain and keep these feelings of ego, these feelings of positive and negative under control. And then we steadily proceed until we can remove this ego and all this positive and negative completely. First we need to restrain to hold it in or to not to to keep it under control and then work on eliminating it completely. The waves are newly arisen. They're not the same as the water. These waves just arise in their illusions, but the water is something genuine and true. It's the same with, with the mind. These, these concepts and feelings of, of ego and self, of positive and negative, these are new. <clears throat> if we can get rid of them, if we can prevent them, then there is just, just the mind. There is just peace and tranquility. And then there is what, <clears throat> there is what we can call true life. Take away the waves and we have true, real water. Let go of all these egos and positives and negatives and there is true life. These concepts of ego, these feelings of positive and negative, are new products. When they come up, there is dukkha. When they don't come by, there is, there is no dukkha. From the, <clears throat> at this point, then, what we need to realize is the fact that these concepts and feelings and beliefs in ego and self are just illusions. There's just these waves that don't have any real substance. They're false. They're deceptive. They're not really true. They're just these these temporary waves that, that deceive us, but in fact there's no reality to these feelings of ego and self. We need to understand this from the, from the start. When we say that there is there's no real self, we need to understand that in most creeds, in fact most psychologies as well, and most religions, there is the, they teach, they believe very firmly that there is a self. But this idea, belief, teaching that's found all over the world, that there is some self or soul, Atman, higher self or whatever we wish to call it. This, this idea, this teaching is not Buddhism. We should not confuse the, the belief in a self or soul with Buddhism. The fact that there isn't any, any real self, this is what, what Buddhism teaches. This fact that there is no self, the fact of selflessness, is a permanent, lasting truth. There is no, there is no permanent truth to the idea of self. If we observe, we can see that these, the self is just a concept or a feeling that arises from time to time, temporarily. It has no lasting substance. You can't find any real truth in it. This is what is understood in Buddhism. The, the, frame, the famous phrase of Descartes, cogito ergo sum, 
I think, therefore I am. This cannot be taken as true. The just because I can think or feel or experience or know, just because, excuse me, just because there's thinking, knowing, feeling, experience, that is no proof or basis that there is any I, any ego, any soul. This idea, of course, hap is much more ancient than Descartes. It's been talked about for thousands and thousands of years, where human beings, just because there is some movement in the mind, thought, feeling, whatever, this is assumed to be I, to be self, to be soul. But we can't really take this as being true. There's no way we can take these, these activities of mind, these thoughts and feelings, as being any real self. They're just products of various causes and conditions. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind come into contact with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and mental objects. From this coming together, there is a production in the mind. Feelings, thoughts, and so on arise. But none of these have any absolute reality. They're just temporary manifestations of mental activity. They're just momentary phenomena. They arise and pass away. There's no, there's no real substance to them. There's no absolute reality or truth to them. And so in no way can they be taken to be a self. And so <clears throat> all these manifestations of mind, thinking like this, thinking like that, this, these and those feelings, are just these momentary activities. They're new, new states of mind. And all of these kinds of mind have no absolute substance or nothing about them that can be taken as I or mind. In Buddhism, mind or consciousness is all often called an element. And although we talk about the consciousness element, one should realize, should understand that we only speak of the conscious element manifesting or appearing from occasionally. It, the appearance, the functioning of the consciousness element depends on causes and conditions. When the eyes and a visual object come into contact or the ear and sounds, this is the conditions under which the, the consciousness element can appear, can manifest. And so, even though we talk of a consciousness element, we're not talking for it, it to work, it to function. It's only occasionally. It's not a permanent kind of thing. And so, there's just this temporary arising of consciousness dependent on causes, dependent on conditions. And so, in Buddhism we recognize that there's no actual selfhood to consciousness, to mind, or to, to anything related to consciousness and mind. These are all just temporary new products of the activity of mind. The thing we call ego or self or soul is merely a concept that arises because of various conditions which are surrounding us. The, the thing we call ego and soul or soul is doesn't have any reality in itself, doesn't have any true, true reality. It's always dependent 
on what we call the internal ayatana, the, the sense organs of eye, ears, and, and so on, and the external ayatana, the, the sense objects of sights, sounds, and so forth, always dependent on these, the concept of self arises. And because it has this conditioned, concocted nature, there's nothing, there's nothing inherently, there's no inherent self, there's no true self in that those concepts about self and soul or and in fact these concepts these these manifestations are not even are not even the true mind this isn't the true mind all these thoughts and and so on these concepts of self of soul of i of, of mind are merely reactions when the, the various sense organs and sense objects act upon the mind. Then the mind reacts in one of the reactions that it, it, it spits up is the concept of, of I, of self. <coughs> the, the concept, self, soul, whatever is just a concept that arises according to the things that that make an impression upon the mind. Depending on these different objects, the mind the mind conjures up the concept of self in in many different forms. But there's nothing about that which has any permanence any lasting quality there's nothing there which is is essential it's just all a temporary arising and passing away and so this this concept of self that the mind keeps coming up with see the mind takes the objects when a new object arises to the mind, the mind comes up with a concept about it and because of a lack of understanding takes that concept to be true. <clears throat> and so the mind, mind thinks, this is mine or this is me, this is I. And because of this misunderstanding concocts the idea, the concept of self. But there's, this is just an illusion. And we should realize this, that these are just reactions of the mind. But these reactions are not, are not in themselves true. And they're not the true mind either. In these bodies, there is a nervous system. And then in this, this environment of ours, there are all kinds of objects which impinge upon, which, which make contact with this nervous system. <clears throat> Each time some object from the environment makes contact with the nervous system, there is a new situation. If this is a new temporary situation that occurs, if this situation pleases the mind, then the mind takes it as, as positive. If the, the situation displeases the mind, the mind takes it as negative. Each of these situations is new. It's just a, a temporary phenomena. But if it's pleasing to the mind, then there arises a positive kind of ego. And if it's displeasing, it's taken as a negative ego. If you understand this, you see then that the, the ego, whether positive or negative, arises after 
the, the situation where objects impinge upon the nervous system. They're just these situations, and then there arises different forms of ego dependent on these situations. Ego, or I, can only arise after these various situations impress upon the, the nervous system. For example, there's a certain physical condition that we call hunger. When this situation of hunger impresses itself on the nervous system, only then can there arise the concept, I am hungry. And then when there is the activity of eating, and this impinges on the nervous system, only then can be the the, the sense of self that I eat. And then only after there is a, a pleasant taste, a delicious taste on the tongue, only after that can there arise the, the concept, I am delicious, or I have deliciousness. So always each of these kinds of ego illusions any of these concepts of I can only happen after these various situations make contact with the, the nervous system. Now, this may, find, this may sound illogical to many of you. What we're saying doesn't fit with the common logic that, that people have. But we can't depend on logic we can't assume that logic is true. We have to look and see what actually happens to see what the reality is. We can't just use logic to, to think about it. <clears throat> the reality is that mind is, is an element and there are all these elements surrounding the mind and when these various elements such as eye elements and sound elements, when these act upon the mind, then the mi then mind manifests, and there is activities of mind. The mind reacts to the various situations with thoughts, with feelings, with and all the other kind of mental activities. These are just reactions of the mind. They have no independent reality. They aren't, they aren't any, any selves. So all of these are just products, just reactions of the mind. And then the, the concept of I, of ego, is just another reaction of mind. This may be difficult for you to understand. It may not fit with our our ordinary assumptions. It's, it's a bit, it may sound strange to us that the, the doer comes after the doing. Our assumption is that there first must be a doer in order there, for there to be any doing, or there must be the actor before the activity. But the reality, logic isn't as important as the reality itself, is that first there is the activity, then there is the actor. There is the acting, and only after there is the acting can there arise the actor. Logic, philosophy, speculation cannot be depended on. When we're, we're dealing with something as subtle and profound as this, just you can think about it as much as you want and that will never that will never show us the truth and so logic philosophy speculation can't really help us if you don't believe what we're saying that's okay go ahead and keep thinking about it and eventually you'll realize that all the thinking and logic and reasoning 
just will never show us what is actually true. It'll just keep spitting up new ideas and opinions. This, this self is just an act. First, <clears throat> there is just the mind and the situations it finds itself in. Mind is always arising to different situations. And then there is an activity of mind in response to the situations or the reactions of mind. One and only then, with this activity of mind, all these situations and the reactions to the situations, only then can there be the concept of I, the I who acts. Without that activity, there could not arise any any concept of the, the actor. The I, the self, the soul is just a concept created after the activity. And so if we, if we examine this, then we, we can see that any sense of I, feeling of I, concept of I is always coming after the activity. It's, it's not really true. This thing we call mind is, is just an element among the many, many elements. Of course this thing really exists, this mind element really exists, but it's one of many, many elements. This world is just full of elements. For mind to function, it can only do so. For the mind element to function, it can only do so dependent on the other elements. By the way, when we use this word element, it's a rather poor translation of a, of a Pali word, datu. And in this word, there's also a sense of potential. They are potentials that ha either have manifested and are functioning or are dormant, have not yet manifested. So these elements or potentials to manifest, to function, to <clears throat> act, can only do so when they come into contact when they, with other elements. So when various elements come together, then there is an activity, some function. For mind to function, it always depends on other elements. So there's nothing, the appearance of mind, of consciousness, isn't something that happens independently. <clears throat> it's always dependent. And so, mind itself, or any of the thoughts, feelings, and activities of mind, are always dependent on these, these other elements. All these elements exist in themselves but none of them can, can act independently. And so the mind element, and, or none of these elements, most of all the mind element, cannot be taken to be an I, a self, a soul, because it, it doesn't have any independence. When you in, <clears throat> have studied science in school, learned about chemistry and physics, they never, never mentioned the mind element. And we're sure that you've never heard about the voidness element either. Modern science only talks about certain elements, but there is there are many other elements that chemistry and physics never talk about. The mind element, the voidness element, and a number of others. In Dhamma language, however, in Dhamma, the mind element and the voidness element are very important. All of these elements <coughs> exist and are functioning within our lives, but to function or 
<clears throat> for any situation to occur, for any experience, mind element and other elements must come together, must meet and then function together. Then there is some situation happening. So to, to understand that all of our experiences, all the situations of our lives are are just made up of these elements, but that these elements which make up all our experiences are, are not independent. They're always interdependent. <clears throat> this can help us to understand the, the nature of our reality. So in short, the concepts of soul, concepts of self, of I, of mine, and whatever, don't really exist. Self, soul, I, ego, mind, don't really have <coughs> any truth. They're merely the products that arise when various elements get together. When, through the coming together of elements, the, the mind element is concocted to think to conceive, to perceive in, in various ways. And so when the mind element is concocted in certain ways, with certain conditions, then it, it conceives of the self, the soul, the I. <clears throat> These are just products arising out of this concocting of the mind element. Now, although and, and nothing about that can be taken to be self, soul, or whatever. Although many, many people, many philosophical systems, psychologies, and religious systems believe very firmly that there is some independent substance that is a self or soul. Although this is a common belief, and people can believe what they wish. If we examine carefully in terms of truth, what is the real nature and truth of what's happening, we will never find any such independent, self-existing self or soul or whatever. <clears throat> All we find are these situations of mind occurring and all of these situations are dependent on conditions, just compounded out of elements. And when the mind element is concocted by ignorance, by misunderstanding, then the, the concept of self is born. But just because we can think it, it doesn't mean it's true. In, in short, Self, soul, I, mine are not real. In the develop of, development of Indian philosophy, one of the, there eventually came about what are called the Upanishads. And in the Upanishads, in the religious philosophy of the Upanishads, it talks about the Atman. The Atman was <coughs> their name for the self, which inhabiting each life, there was a self, or very much what Plato and many Christians following Plato called the soul. And then supposedly this Atman, when the body died, this Atman would go and be reincarnated. Reincarnate means to take on a new body the Atman would get a new body, and that body would die, and the Atman would go and get another body. And this process went on and on and on, the Atman reincarnating over and over again. At the time of the Upanishads, this was the highest teaching in India. A few hundred la years later, while this teaching was still very strong and dominant in, in India, that there was some kind of Atman 
being born and reincarnating over and over again, the Buddha appeared. The Buddha arose in the, the middle of a culture dominated by this, this teaching. But the Buddha taught something different. The Buddha taught, based on his own experience, that there was no self. This Atman did not really exist. And so he taught non-Atman or not Atman. And then this, this is the genuine teaching of Buddhism, that whatever we call it, Atman, self, soul, I, ego, whatever, in whatever language, it doesn't really exist. It's just a concept concocted by ignorance. However, this Hindu teaching, back then they didn't call it Hindu, it was Brahmanism, it's now called Hinduism. This Hindu teaching from the Upanishads spread all over Asia, including to Thailand. And then Buddhism came later. To much of Asia, Buddhism came after these Brahmanistic teachings of the Upanishad. And so nowadays we find this situation that many Buddhists misunderstand Buddhism. People who call themselves Buddhists foolishly mix up non-Buddhist teachings in with, in with what they call Buddhism. And so there are many foolish Buddhists who believe in this, this idea of reincarnation of this self or soul that gets reincarnated. Or some of them don't use the word reincarnation, they use the word rebirth. But it's the same mistake. And so, please be very careful. Many foolish Buddhists have made a mess of Buddhism by dragging in things that are not the Buddha's teaching. So one has to be very careful to always see this fundamental teaching of the Buddha that that everything is not self, not Atman, and to not get misled by people talking about things getting reborn or reincarnated. This is just part of the situation we live in where people are always prone to misunderstanding. Please distinguish clearly and absolutely between the belief that there is an Atman soul and the belief that there and the teaching that there is no Atman. There's of non Atman, not self. There are these two fundamental understandings. Please distinguish between them. The Buddhist the genuine Buddhist teaching is that of not-self, not-atma, not-soul. Not now, many, generally, most people just go with their, their own instinctual feelings. And in Christianity, this, this subject has not been examined carefully. Christianity has not analyzed it very much. And so, in Christianity, for example, things are talked about in the ordinary terms that everybody is already believes. Most people assume that there is a self or a soul. There is kind of an instinctual sense of self, which is just created by ignorance. The ignorance are not, the instincts are not necessarily wise. And so this sense of self is concocted. And most people just take that to be true without examining it. So the common assumption is that there is some, something that I am, some self, some soul, some ego. And Christianity has just gone along with that and tried to make it better and better. But in Buddhism, if we're interested in Buddhism, the only real issue is that of, 
of dukkha and the end of dukkha. And so Buddhism goes deeply into things until one can see that this that there is in fact not self. There is nothing that can be called a self. And seeing this, dukkha can be eliminated. Seeing that there's no positive, no negative. This is how Buddhism goes much deeper than the common understanding. It goes much deeper beyond self, beyond positive and negative. And this is how Buddhism eliminates suffering. You may be surprised <clears throat> when we tell you that in Buddhism we consider ignorance to be just another element. The ignorance element is just another element like all the others. But it's an element that's all over the place. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere in, in the the atmosphere, the universe around us. And so when, when the body and mind are in some situation, when the various elements of body and mind are coming together in a situation, this ignorance element is always kind of there, ready to, to come in and go to work. So whenever in body and mind start to function, the ignorance element can come in and then concoct that function of body and mind with ignorance. And so if the ignorance element influences or works in the mental functions, <coughs> the mental processes, then there is the conception of, of ego, of positive and negative. But this is just an element. It's not something eternal or lasting. Ignorance is not I or mine. It's just an element that can get involved in the functions of, of life. So in any or ordinary day, every time the eye makes contact with so sights, Every time the ear and sounds make contact, the nose and smells, the tongue and taste, the body and touches, and the mind sense and mind objects. Any time <clears throat> these normal, normal act functions of life occur, the ignorance element can enter in. The ignorance element can, can work upon these things. We call this avicca dhatu, avicca dhatu, the ignorance element or the element of ignorance. And it could enter into any of these basic, ex any of these experiences and activities of life. And then when, when this ignorance element works upon consciousness, then consciousness or mind comes up with concepts of I, of self, of positive and negative. Now when the sense organs and sense objects are, are functioning, ignorance element keeps coming in. We aren't able to stop it. We aren't able to prevent against it. So then ignorance keeps concocting the concepts of ego, of positive and negative. However, there is another element which we call vicha dhatu. The ignorance element is avicca dhatu. But vicha is means right knowledge, insight, wisdom. You can even use the word enlightenment. So, vicha dhatu we could call the element of right knowledge, the element of enlightenment. If normally there's, we don't have this vicha dhatu, and so the ignorance element is always able to do its work.
and concoct the mind. But if there is the vicha datu, if the vicha datu manifests, appears, then it prevents the functioning of the avicha datu. In simple terms, if there is a glimpse of truth, if there is a glimpse of truth, that glimpse gets rid of ignorance. And so then in that moment, the mind is not concocted by ignorance, by stupidity. And then in that moment, no concept of I, of positive, of negative, is concocted. But normally, this isn't the case. Ordinarily, for, for most human beings, it's the element of ignorance that is, that is functioning. Ignorance is just an element. And like any other thing, ignorance arises momentarily. <clears throat> the belief or the teaching that many Buddhists propagate incorrectly, that ignorance is there all the time, this is incorrect. People are always implying that there is ignorance in the mind constantly, all the time. They turn ignorance into some, they try to turn ignorance into some permanent thing that's <clears throat> always in the mind. That we're always, that the mind is always ignorant. This is completely incorrect. It is, the ignorance just arises momentarily in the mind depending on conditions. It is correct, however, to say that the element of ignorance is always there, ready to come in, ready to influence the mind. But ignorance is not in the mind all the time. It just arises momentarily. This is a fundamental fact in Buddhism, that, that phenomena, including ignorance, arise momentarily and cease. They arise and cease, arise and cease, arise and cease. They don't exist permanently. They don't have any permanent, lasting existence. Now this ignorance element is always ready to come in, and it's given the advantage. The way we live, the way we behave, gives the advantage to the ignorance element so it can influence the mind quite easily. The enlightenment element, the element of insight, however, is always ready as well. But we don't, but it's not easy for it to come in. The, the way we live makes the enlightenment element the vicha datu disadvantaged. What is required then is sati. With sati or mindfulness, it's possible to bring in the enlightenment element. Without sati, ignorance is, is free to come in. The ignorance element is free to concoct the mind, but with mindfulness, attentiveness, carefulness, then the enlightenment element can function. And so this sati is the necessary condition for bringing in wisdom, bringing in correct knowledge. So sati, you've probably noticed, is the last part of the word anapanasati, <clears throat> mindfulness with breathing. And thus, mindfulness with breathing is the way to new life. Through mindfulness with breathing, sati, first of all, through mindfulness with breathing, the vicha datu is, is developed. One gets much more familiar with it. 
experienced in using the vicha dhatu, the, the element of enlightenment, and sati, which is just another dhatu as well, is developed. And then sati can creates the opportunity for the for wisdom and insight. <clears throat> And so anapanasati, by developing these, is the way to new life. Obviously, sati, this thing we call sati, or mindfulness, is, is crucial. Because with sati, sati has the ability to keep away the ignorance element and to bring in the enlightenment element. Sati is what prevents ignorance and what makes possible insight and wisdom. And so now you might be thinking that sati is quite a good thing and you may really, you may really love sati. This is really wonderful stuff. And then you may be going, well, sati must be the self. Maybe sati is what I, I really am. This, of course, is to misunderstand things once again. Sati, mindfulness, is just another element. That's all. There's no way that sati can be I or mine. It's just an element arising dependent on conditions. There's no way it can be I or mine. This may be sounding funny to you, but in Buddhism, Everything is just elements. Everything are merely datus. Datus, remember, isn't just... Element in English can mean just the smallest bit of something. But the smallest particle of something. But datu doesn't mean the smallest particle. It just means the fundamental building blocks which are much more like potentials, which appear or don't appear. In Buddhism, everything are just dhatus, and dhatus come together, function, and this appears, and they function, and this appears, and they function, and this appears. Sati is just one of many dhatus, and so we, we can't take it to be I and mine, because in no way can it be independent. It can only operate dependent on other datus. So, still, sati is, is crucial, but don't go and take it to be I or mine, even though sati may seem very positive to you. we should see that sati is that which can help us to get rid of all positiveness and negativeness. Sati and anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, is the means or the way to get rid of all the positive and all the negative. In the science and chemistry that we've, we've learned in our modern education, <clears throat> we've been taught that element means the smallest particle of things. And we have the periodic table with the 103 or 105 elements, which are the fundamental material particles of things. In fact, in Thai, they use the Pali word datu to translate the English word element. And so when they teach children about chemistry, they use the word datu or tat in this very limited way. That's how the, it's understood in modern science, <coughs> which is generally limited to physical and material things. But in, in Dhamma, when we're talking about natural truth. Datu means something that exists naturally within itself. Things that 
exist within themselves, maintain themselves, or let's just say that exist naturally within themselves. We could translate it as natural essences, natural essences, or natural elements. But they're not anything, they're natural. They're not I, they're not mine. They happen naturally. They can't be possessed or owned or controlled by any ego or self. So if this is how we should understand the word <coughs> datu, naturally existing elements, natural essences that exist by and of themselves. No one or nothing can control them, own them, be them, possess them. If we understand this meaning of datu or element, then we can see how everything are elements. Everything are just datus, naturally occurring datus. The body, <clears throat> the physical part of life, is just elements, merely these datus. The mind, consciousness, is merely datus, these naturally existing essences. And then even the spiritual part of life, the spiritual, are just elements. Although the spiritual is much more subtle, it's still merely datus, these natural essences which exist in themselves. Everything is made up of are just datus. And so when anything that's just datus, none of that can be taken to be I or mine. It's just these natural essences. There's no I, self, soul, mind, ego, or any of that. Even higher than that, or beyond even further than that, we can say that all the all these things that are concocted are just elements. When we say everything is just elements, there are these concocted elements. There are these things which are can be concocted and which are concocted. These are all elements. And that which is unconcocted, which can never be concocted, which is completely unconcoctable, that too is an element. Or what is called phenomena are just elements, these natural essences. And that which is called noumena, the noumena, is also just a natural essence. Everything are just these datus. We, mo there are the, all the, everything is made up of the sankata datus, the concoct, the elements of concocting, and the asankata datu, the, ele the unconcocted natural essence. So everything are just, are just datus. There's nothing that can be taken to be I or mine. Please forgive us if anyone here is a Christian or Jewish, but we have to say that even God is just a datu. There's just no exception to the fact that everything is datus. Whether Satan is just datus, God is just datus. Everything are just these natural essences. Whenever one has this understanding that everything are just these, these natural essences, these natural datus, whenever there is this understanding, then one has a tamayata. One understands a tamayata. At the present time, we, we don't have a tamayata. We don't understand this. 
at the, at the present moment we're, we're generally ignorant. We misunderstand things. And so we don't see that everything is just natural elements. And so one ought to be very careful to realize that if the way we see things, that the way we see things now is incorrect. And so therefore, the way of seeing, the way of understanding that is the opposite of how we see things now, that's what's correct. To see things completely differently than we see them now is, is correct. In, in the Pali language of the Buddha, this is called anyata, to be completely different, completely opposite. To see things as completely opposite, and to see everything completely differently from the way we see them now, is to see that everything is just these natural essences, these, these datus. Now, our understanding is incorrect. We misunderstand just about everything. Although this misunderstanding is, is just arising and passing away, dependent on conditions. But almost all the time, we take this body to be something permanent, to be mine. We take the mind to be permanent, to be mine or me. We take the thoughts to be permanent, to be mine. We take happiness to be permanent. We take it as mine. We take pain as permanent and mine. Every time one of these phenomena, body, mind, pain, dukkha, happiness, whatever, once any of these phenomena appears, it is immediately misunderstood to be permanent and to be mine, to be self to be me or mine. So, in this way we're, we're taking, and but we don't realize this. We keep doing this. The mind keeps getting concocted by the ignorance element, but we don't realize it. We're not aware of it. And so we take that which is untrue as the truth. We, we, although we take this misunderstanding as the truth. And so we need to see things in a completely different way, to see that our present understanding is incorrect, that seeing everything as being permanent is false. Everything is impermanent. None of it is I or mine. We need to look at things in this completely different way. Now, when we talk about the truth and untruth of things, there's, there's a few things that can be a bit humorous and amusing. So you'll have to listen very carefully because we, we have to be careful about such, about such things. Everything has its truth. Everything has its truth. In untruth, in fact, there is truth. There is a reality to untruth. So that when we, we have our misunderstanding has a truth to it. There is truth in non-truth. There is truth in untruth. But we go and take the truth as untru of untruth as our truth, and this deceives us. If we take the truth of untruth as the real truth, this is deceiving, it's a false truth. But this is what we're doing. In the positive, in the negative, in happiness and sadness, there is a truth. But this is a kind of truth which is a false truth. 
or it's a truth that doesn't do us any good. It doesn't really help us. We need to find the truth of truth that is really true and that doesn't deceive, which isn't false. There's the truth that is genuinely beneficial. And then there are all the, in everything there is some truth. But there is the false truth that isn't any good. The truth of untruth. But then there is the, the real truth, the truth of truth. Which doesn't deceive, which isn't false. Which is truly beneficial. We call this kind of truth the Arya Satya, the noble truths. Or Arya literally means that which has no enemies. So it's the enemyless truth. This is the truth that lead, the truth that leads beyond all suffering, that transcends all suffering, that ends all suffering. This is the truth that is truly beneficial. To put it simply, <laughs> in, in lies, there is the reality of the lie. There is the truth of the lie. In, in anything that isn't true, there is the truth of that untruth or the truth of that, the reality of that untruth. If we see the truth of everything, if we see the truth even in untruth, the reality even of untruth. If we can see this, then we, we will understand truth completely, <clears throat> thoroughly. The truth of, of people who are still influenced by ignorance is called relative truth. Samuti Satcha. The the truth of assumptions and suppositions, the relative truth. And the, but the truth of those who are truly intelligent, people who are no longer affected by ignorance, we call this absolute truth or ultimate truth, paramata satya, the truth that transcends, that goes beyond. When we're born into this world, all we get are the samuti satcha, the relative truths. From the moment of our birth, we're taught, given, just, and trained in, educated to just the relative truths. Never in our childhood or even, <clears throat> for most people, even in adulthood, are we told about ultimate truth. No one ever teaches it. You don't find it in the schools or on TV. Nobody is talking about ultimate truth. <clears throat> even if we, we went and told children about ultimate truth, for the most part, they wouldn't believe it. They're so hoodwinked by relative truth, the truth that is, has the nature of, of lying to us. In relative truth, there is, there is always the lie hidden within it. But now, we've, all of you have, have lived life long enough. You've spent enough time with relative truth. You've had enough experience <clears throat> with relative truth that you ought to be ready to hear some ultimate truth. So the time has come to hear about the ultimate truth, the truth that doesn't deceive in any way. It's about time that you heard at least a little bit about ultimate truth, absolute truth. If you tell your children that that deliciousness and foulness are equally hassles for us. They, they won't believe it. 
if you say that taste things that taste good and things that taste bad are are equally difficult they won't believe it or to say that beautiful and not beautiful are problem are equal problems for us they won't believe it or to say that sweet smelling and foul smelling are are equally difficult for us and troublesome they won't believe it you can't tell a child that the positive and the negative are equally problems for us they just they won't understand one must wait until until each person has had enough experience with these relative truths has come to under see these relative truths for what they really are then one is able to understand that the positive and the negative the beautiful and the unbeautiful the sweet and the foul are equally hassles and troubles and problems for us our cultural educational and intellectual heritage is just one of the relative truths but it's there comes a time when we're ready to to hear about to learn about and to start to pay attention to ultimate truth the gentlemen and gentle women who are the the ordinary followers of of a religion including buddhism when they when they come here we we try to tell them that that good and evil are as <laughs> are equally dangerous for us that virtue in sin are equally dangerous for us we do our best to explain this to these good men and women who come to and who consider themselves to be followers of Buddhism but they never believe it they just won't believe it they can't understand it and they they don't believe it when we say that positive and negative are equally dangerous and harmful they just won't accept it all the ordinary people who call themselves buddhists never really become buddhists because they won't accept the ultimate truth people when they first get interested in religion they're they very interested in what's good and positive they're interested in being good being virtuous being moral in order so they can go to heaven or something they're very interested in being good they even become crazy and obsessed with with being good and virtuous and all that and when we when we tell them that good and evil will kill you both both of these will kill you which is exactly what god told adam and eve good and evil kill equally but no they don't believe this we try and explain it over and over again but the ordinary good men and women just won't accept it this is the difficulty that prevents people from ever getting to the true religion whether christian buddhist or whatever the inability to accept ultimate truth clinging and grasping at relative truth for as long as they can <clears throat> relative truth helps us to get stuck in the positive and to be to hate and be frightened of the negative ultimate truth allows us to be free of to transcend and go beyond both positive and negative to go beyond both happy gladness and sadness beyond happiness and dukkha beyond right and wrong beyond good 
and evil beyond ultimate truth allows us to to go beyond everything to transcend everything in relative truth of ordinary common people there is happiness and suffering and when we tell these ordinary people that there is something beyond happiness and suffering that one can live completely free of happiness and suffering they're not at all interested they say what's in it for me what what, what good is there in being beyond happiness and suffering this shows that they're still stuck still obsessed with happiness with the positive and so we tell them there is a happiness which is beyond happiness real happiness is beyond happiness if we speak in relative terms we use the word happiness if we speak in ultimate terms we use the words the end of dukkha the end of dukkha is in ultimate terms the end of positive and negative we tell them that the happiness which hasn't any meaning or value of happiness that is the true happiness and then they say we're crazy when we have ended the stupidity of self of soul of i and mind then then happiness and suffering end all happiness and all dukkha end and then the positive in the negative end and we're beyond all all problems and troubles but first the illusion of self of ego of soul must must disappear and so then we need to tell ourselves all the time i i am the i which is not really i i am an i which is not really i and then we should be telling our friends you are a you which is not really you you are a you which isn't really you if we can understand this then it will be of tremendous value and even if they say we're crazy don't worry about it just keep saying i am an i that's not really i you are a you that's not really you and give them a chance and some day they may understand if we can understand this it will help us it will help us quite a bit and when we really see that i am an i which isn't really i then atamaya da will will be right there will arise instantly so that's an outline of the the new way of life tomorrow we'll we'll go into more details about the new way of life and how anapanasati can can help that as for today our time is up so we'll close now and once again thank you for for listening very patiently and and very attentively <laughs>